Hi, Dr. Patrick Gentempo here, and thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel. We have great content in store for you. I'm so excited to be here with you, and let's jump right into it. An incredible statistic is only 0.1%, one thousandth of a percent of the glyphosate or Roundup that's sprayed worldwide actually hits its target. Wow. One thousandth of a percent, 99.99% .99 of this chemical is going right into our water systems as wash off and never reaches its therapeutic target of the weed, if you will. And so the consumer, I think the homeowner was the first to really misuse this chemical. We were spraying down things we didn't understand and just washing into our gutter systems that then went to our municipal water processing plant. Organophosphates are super water soluble, very hard to pull out. And so we started drinking Roundup by the 1990s. And so, that pattern happened, but we were starting to saturate the curve. So 1992 came around and, and the company needed a new niche. It said, okay, well, these farmers are not using enough Roundup. Why? Because every plant that stuff touches, it kills. So they were having to spot spray the borders of their farms and everything else. And so Monsanto intelligently looked at the, system, the situation as like, there must be some crop that needs to be killed. And there is, it's wheat. And so in 1992, they went to the industry and said, we have an amazing new chemical for you that is a desiccant. So instead of calling it a weed killer, they called it a desiccant or drying agent. And this was a huge boon for wheat farmers, in, especially in northern climates of the US. Wheat has to not only mature, grow, go to seed and dry, it needs to be dry for a period of time and then cut and then lay dry for a couple of days before it can be harvested effectively. If at any point in there it gets wet, you have to wait again for it to dry before you can cut it. And so it's dangerous to be a wheat farmer in northern climates because if you get an early snow or you start to get weather falling apart late, you can lose a whole crop and so you lose your crop. And so Monsanto came in and said, look, you can dry your wheat early. You don't, why are you going to sit there and watch the paint dry? Go ahead and just shoot your, your crop with Roundup, the whole wheat crop, and then you can harvest it three days later. It'll be dead and dry and you can just harvest early. Well, this, of course, immediately led to not only the possibility of saving your one crop, it meant that in slightly further south, you could grow two crops, not one in a single growing season. So instead of watching that wheat grow to maturity, dry and die and harvest, they were watching it mature, go to seed, they'd kill it, harvest it, put a second crop in the ground, let that come, kill it, harvest it before winter came. And this is still pre-GMO. This other is words, 1992 still. Yeah, so, so GMOs aren't even introduced, but they're still using the chemicals, chemicals in a way now to increase uh, more first, yield. First time that we had used it to speed a, an actual crop to market. It was the first time we'd actually applied glyphosate directly to a food item right before it harvested. Is there an absurdity though to saying, hey, take this crop and kill it? <laughs> you know, dry it? You know, in other words, is that like, did, did it bring rise to anybody saying, well, what is killing it? And it's on the crop that we're gonna eventually be eating. Two incredible questions. Has a shortcut ever been the right decision in nature? <laughs> like, right. In nature, exactly. Does, does it ever really work to outsmart nature? Mm -hmm. And the answer is always no. Mm -hmm. And this is an obvious one. And we do this in all kinds of more subtle ways in our food industry. Um, you think about, if you go to your grocery store right now, 365 days a year, you can go buy a ripe avocado, right? Or you can go buy an apple. 365 days a year in any climate. All of these are symptoms of the fact that we're shortcutting nature. And so in the US here, we, we eat an enormous amount of produce from South America during our winter months. And to get a crop, like a piece of fruit, from Chile to a grocery store shelf in New York in December, you have to do some shortcuts because if you really picked it right from the field, it would be rotted by the time it got to New York. So you have to pick it prematurely. And then it's ripened under ethylene gas that's in the, in the transport cases. They're feeding ethylene gas into it on the way to ripen the fruit artificially so that when, by the time it gets to New York and on your shelf, it's ripe, but it's not rotting. So if we, we take fruit that's been picked prematurely and then artificially ripened, or in the case of wheat, we kill it prematurely and we don't let the ripening process happen naturally, we obviously are going to lose nutrient quality to the food. Nature so designed every berry, every piece of fruit, every vegetable 
to be at its perfect moment when it's at its, its full potential. And, and that full potential is nutrient-wise, it's size-wise, it's everything is perfect. So if we shortcut that and say, we're gonna not let the wheat come, what's gonna happen? We're gonna change the carbohydrate to fiber ratios in that gluten. The gluten ratios to its fiber ratios are gonna change. And so we suddenly started creating wheat that was abnormal for the body to handle. Simultaneously to this then, uh, we un unknowingly as consumers and farmers perhaps, but what we were doing is adding glyphosate which would become a chemical that actually has a very synergistic effect with gluten. And so we actually created gluten sensitivity out of this one effect. Gluten sensitivity is a reality of biology. Our biology is sensitive to gluten, mm -hmm. but it's never in excess of it. So we should always be able to keep up with gluten. Gluten's been in our diet for thousands of years without a problem. Suddenly in the 1990s, there was this beginning phase of celiac disease, which is the autoimmune condition to, to gluten compounds. And then there was this huge new realization of, oh, oh my gosh, so many of us are gluten sensitive. We're having bloating, fatigue, brain fog, poor sex drive, infertility, insulin resistance, and all this. And then you take gluten out of diet and people get better. So that was really early in the 1990s. I mean, there was a few people, a few practitioners talking about it. But then you fast forward to 2008, 2010, 20 years now, 2012, with that wheat being treated with glyphosate, suddenly we have you know, somewhere around 18 million people in the United States alone that have been diagnosed with this and probably 10 times that many that are gluten sensitive and don't know it yet. The biology of this is fascinating and our, our research team will be publishing a paper in the next few months on this of the science that we've been doing over the last few years, but what we've shown is that glyphosate actually hits the cell membranes of the intestine and when it, when it does, it upregulates the receptor for gliadin, which is the gluten breakdown product that causes the gluten sensitivity leaky gut effect. And so unknowingly, we not only created an abnormal crop with desiccant approach or early drying, where we had high gluten to fiber ratios and all this abnormal nutrient quality of the food, we also simultaneously had a toxin that was synergistic with the gluten products itself to cause this biologic damage. Sort of a perfect storm that starts to, you know, perfect form. storm. Thanks so much for being here and watching that video. And can I ask you to please subscribe to our channel so you can find out when we're posting new content. You'll be alerted right away when we do to share this with people you think might benefit from the information. And certainly it helps us if you like the video. So if you like what you just saw, go ahead and hit that like button. And again, thank you so much for being here with me right now.